So I've been looking into the accounts in the Gospels about when Jesus, I believe he's in Galilee, I can't remember of the name of the country he went over into, like Gennesaret or Gennesara. I want to say it's the Gennesarenes. I don't know. I don't claim to be a Bible scholar. Whatever the case, he travels over to that country and he ends up encountering this man who's possessed by demons. He's out of his mind, like literally. We've all heard this story, as is the case with most Bible stories. For anyone who's been in the church or had an upbringing in a Christian home, we think we know these stories, and we do know them topically. We do know them. But we kind of know them like we know other stories we read as a child or other books that were read to us or we kind of know the storyline and they kind of as we get older if you don't stay within the context of a maturing relationship that's that's individual you know we're not going to go into defining what a believer is like unless you pursue that in maturity and of course unless you're regenerated and even have the ability to receive the spiritual dynamics if you will behind the scriptures the 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 very words of God upon a page unless you have that ability given by God to receive the revelation of the scriptures then they're just going to remain as they often began, as just stories. You know, I don't even like saying the word stories. I'm, I always try to be careful, even when I'm talking with my son, that I don't tell him that these are Bible stories. Because stories kind of conjures up an assumption that, you know, we call, we read stories about tractors and trucks and we read stories about families you know fiction stories fables and I think it would do us good to make that distinction even when we train our children when we approach the scriptures ourselves do we properly have an understanding that we're not reading stories we're not reading inspirational Stories. We're reading a living word that are accounts of events, experiences, circumstances that real men lived or made an account, made a record of, and recorded. And really, the only thing that we have that we could say is fiction, which we have to be careful, is like when Jesus spoke in parables, he in a sense was telling us fictional stories. But even those, as Jesus would often explain, these were, these were not just <laughs> stories as we would define them. But they were examples often of what the kingdom is. And what it means to follow Him and know Him and respond to Him. And so really, there's we need to be clear from the beginning that there's no thing, there's no account, there's no record in the Scriptures that is just a good Bible story meant to inspire us or even solely just to instruct us as if it were some modern day 10 steps to Christian living or 30 days to 
Christian success. You know, that's that's kind of our present age's opinion of what the scriptures are. And we gather information to promote a topic and we just rip scriptures right out of their context and line them upon one another to advance a point, to advance a ideal. And that's not what scripture is intended to be, but that's for another day. In my opinion, that's not the point or purpose of the accounts that God ordained and has preserved through the authors and those who are given the responsibility to preserve that scripture, that written, spoken, originally word of God to a man, to men, to make its way all the way to us here today, which is incredible in and of itself that that has happened. That is just amazing to me. Now, of course, it's worth discussing what version is right. What is it that is really even accurate according to the author's intent and what he meant when he said a certain word? Now, we do need to give ourselves to know that, and that's studying to show yourself approved. That's meditating on the scriptures and and digging out that treasure that's buried within ages of translation and misinterpretation. And of course, our, our solid foundation, our only solid place, as I've wrestled through this over the years of like, I don't even know what version to read that is true. How do I know that when this word temple is in Romans, is that even what Paul meant when he spoke that? And so it's it's worth our time to peer into those things and know what it is that even means. So back to my point, as is generally the case, I think I say that every time I talk more than 10 minutes, or apparently more than five. So I've been looking at the story of of Jesus encountering the demoniac. The man possessed by many demons. And Jesus, of course, has an exchange with this man who lives amongst the tombs and cuts himself. He is obviously easily identifiable as a man who is greatly afflicted. I don't know how common this was in that day. I don't know if there were certain protocols and that's what banished him outside of the city gates. I don't know. There's probably things to that I've not yet found, of course, that I can't share out of now because I simply don't know about it. But whatever the case, Jesus meets this man... And as is always true when Jesus is doing anything, especially performing signs and wonders, there's a great multitude of people. There's a crowd of people very engaged at what is taking place. So Jesus, again, as we know, commands the demons to leave this poor man afflicted. And the demons that are in there say, their name is Legion, we are many. Have you come to have your way with us before our appointed time? Paraphrased. Can't you, you can't do this yet, Jesus, can you? We know what our end is. We know what's to come for us. We're well aware. But... Are you sure you can do that to us now? Are we in that age yet? Would you cast us into the pigs instead? 
Now, there's some inner questions I have about all that that I won't go into about, you know, granting the request of a demon. I think there's something within that about Jesus' proper order within the present law of the earth and knowing the fulfilling timing of God in the predestined, preordained time that the demons actually referenced. Jesus didn't need reminded of that. So they didn't persuade Jesus to change his mind or like Jesus didn't, I don't believe, have an epiphany by the demon's knowledge of reminding him of an age that was yet to come. I don't think Jesus was like, oh yeah, that's, oh, you're right. Thanks for reminding me. I can't do that yet. There's, there's things within that that I don't yet understand. Or maybe just don't need to look into yet. And so as we know, there's a herd of pigs there. The demons, of course, are aware of this. They say, would you cast us into the swine? I think there's a lot of interesting imagery there for that present time about the pigs being the unclean animal and the demons being the unclean spirits indwelling that afflicted man. It was a good compatibility test for the demons that proved true. So Jesus says, go. Go into the swine. And I won't get ahead of myself real quick because I'll, I'll kind of miss my my point that I'm sensing in the in the uh, purpose of the account. I've got to believe that, like, when Jesus is addressing this man and about to deliver him, the people were probably, at the very least, very intrigued at what they were about to see. What is he going to do? Because obviously, up until that point, nobody there possessed the spiritual prowess to command those demons to come out. I don't know if it was an area of great unbelief. I'll get to that point of why I think that's true. But we're not told many specifics about, like, these were people who did X. We're not told a lot about the exact circumstance of the people's heart condition right then and there in that moment of the multitudes that were, were watching this. But it's what, it's what follows that intrigues me. And so if we can imagine the scenario about these people watching Jesus dialogue with these demons and then command them to go into the swine... And I've got to wonder in that moment if the people were in awe that that happened. Like, what kind of time frame are we talking about when the demons leave the man and enter the animal? The unclean spirits enter the unclean animal and leave the man completely sane and in his right mind. That is awesome. Imagine knowing this man your whole life. Not personally necessarily, but like, surely he was known in that area as who he was. Don't go out to the tombs, son. You know who's out there. Don't go out there. And what if he came into the city? I don't know. I mean, that may be even in the scriptural account, and I don't know it. But whatever the case, you know, do we imagine, like, what that was like for them to see this man that they knew was so greatly afflicted? And then saying, whoa, he stopped cutting himself. He probably put some clothes on and sat down like, Peace surely came over him. Jesus himself did a deliverance (coughs) service. A deliverance service right there of a man completely riddled with demons. And he suddenly 
miraculously, instantaneously sane and free. And so I wonder in that moment, are they like excited? Are they just in awe? Are they, wow, what in the world does this Jesus possess? But then something very interesting happens that I think within that account, again, not just some Bible story, demon-filled man, Jesus says, go to the pigs, the pigs run and jump off the cliff. Next story. No. Let's look at that a little bit closer because some of the commentaries that I've read, and in all honesty, can we say, like, how do they arrive at these often assumptions? I don't know. I've read some very intriguing possibilities. But let's just say for the sake of conversation, because we do know that and part of the commentary's approach is, of course, what, what was insinuated by the author in, in the Gospels in regards to legion. We are many. What did that mean? What did it insinuate? Like, are we talking a dozen? How many are we talking about? Is there significance to it? Well, I would believe somewhat because a lot of the commentaries that I found from different approaches believe that it was insinuated to mean possibly as many as 2,000. That as many as 2,000 swine, 2,000 pigs, (laughs) became dwellings for demons. And because of that, they ran and jumped off the cliff to their death. Okay, well, what's significant about that? Is Jesus into animal cruelty? What do we ask ourselves? Do we ask ourselves anything? So my wondering is this. And it's found within the people's response, the multitude's response, the people who watch this unfold. The scriptures say the people became frightened. And it's it's documented in a little bit different verbiage throughout the Gospels. One says they were frightened. One says, you know, they were just very afraid. One translation says terrified of one of the accounts. I believe it was in Luke. I'm not sure. And so my thought pattern is, well, why weren't they terrified before? Wouldn't it be more terrifying? Shouldn't it, have, shouldn't it have been documented that the people were terrified in the act of the deliverance of like this lunatic of a man possessed by thousands of demons? I mean, my goodness, wouldn't that be what's terrifying? But it stood out to me that the people after Jesus sent the demons to the swine and then the swine jumped off to their death, the people became terrified. And here's the most intriguing part. They beseeched Jesus to leave them. They commanded he go. Look, this is not okay here. You need to leave now. No reference of the awesome miracle work of God to free this man. No expression of thankfulness. No recognition of the one true God setting a man free. Nobody seemed to join in with the jubilation of this man delivered. I haven't thought until right now, imagine that poor man. Imagine that for a moment. What he must have felt like to be delivered. What if he would have been sane in his right mind and clothed and like clear-eyed speaking clearly with and making sense, no longer hurting himself. And he looks to someone who he likely knew from that area in his immeasurable thankfulness and like, what just happened? 
And nobody, we're not told that anyone rejoiced with him. We're not told that anybody said, glory be to God. Or, this, is, this man is surely the son of God, as he says. Who is this man who performs these signs and wonders? Praise be to Yahweh. We're not told of anything like that. The poor man's standing there, presumably just he and Jesus. Which lends me to think that is why that little part of that account ends with him begging Jesus to let him go with him. Jesus, would you please let me come with you? Let me go where you're going, please. Could he have felt that way? Could he have rightfully said, nobody here even sees your miracle working power that you just performed in my life. You changed me. You moved me from death to life, literally. And they're telling you to get out. Please don't leave me here with these people. Can I come with you? Please let me come with you. Jesus, of course, responds with an instruction to go and tell your household what has happened to you today. Declare to the people what the Lord has done. And it says he goes throughout all the city declaring the work of God in his life, the miracle-working Jesus who changed him. Imagine this man's testimony. And so the people, though, they're ticked off. They're irate. They're greatly angered and they're frightened. They're, they're afraid of what they saw. Well, what was it that made them so afraid? Why were they made afraid? And I'm just going to propose a question of thought. Could it be that these 2,000 pigs were representative of them, some commentaries say that it was like the community's possession. Another commentary said that maybe it was local farmers owned many livestock. Whatever the case, could we not say that this was rep representative of some of their possessions, something of theirs? And in that day and time, livestock was incredibly valuable. It meant the livelihood of people, literally. I have five calves right now. If all five calves that I possess were dead when I got home from work today, it would not affect my life. It would cost me. I am financially invested and I am responsibly committed to take care of those cows. But my entire literal livelihood is not dependent upon them because there's only five of them. And they don't presently provide me with life, food. They have very little value monetarily and just as a purpose. They're few in number and they just don't have a whole lot of value. But that's not the case for these here. If, in fact, it was 2,000 pigs, this cost somebody something. If it's true that they're communal, I don't know. I'm sure someone does. I, I'm not that guy. I'm just proposing some thought. If they were communal possession, these people had to instantly choose how they saw what took place. And we're told very clearly that they completely overlooked the spiritual dynamic of what happened for that demoniac. Instead of rejoicing in his deliverance and freedom and salvation, ultimately, they saw their loss. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is getting personal. I thought you were just going to set this dude free. Nobody said that we were going to lose 
2,000 of our livestock here. I don't think I like this. I guess it's great that this man's getting free, but whoa, whoa, whoa. This isn't supposed to cost me anything. What do I have with that guy? He's not my responsibility. And herein, I think, begins what has been a common thread throughout the last several years of my life, which is the theme of the scriptures of viewing things as a natural man will always miss the spiritual intent of what Jesus was teaching us, what he was showing and living out on the earth and has made its way to us today. And I would even interject in the middle of this before I get to my next point that Jesus would like us to live aware of that reality that we have the option. Could we not even say specifically that when something happens for a brother? And if you don't know what context I mean that in, like in the body of Christ, like in the brethren reality. If 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 a brother is delivered, if he's freed, if he's changed, and it costs me something, if it hurts me, if it affects me in any way, I have that same option that those people had in Gennesara, if that's what it is. I have that same option to say what was not evident there, which is praise Yahweh. Praise be to God for this miracle that happened before our very eyes. I knew this man. Or we can look through a limited, natural, first Adam tendency, which is, well, what, is this, what does this mean for me? Is this going to affect me? Will this harm me? Is this going to be something that is going that I'm going to have to deal with? Is there going to be repercussions from this that are going to make its way all the way to me? Again, individual mindset rooted and established in the first Adam obsessed with self. And so, I'll move to my next point because we're almost 30 minutes in already. So Jesus, he, he's like, okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> he, he tells the demoniac that we would say, oh man, that poor guy, gosh. Jesus just left him behind? Well, I, what do I do with that? That's That was his way. I mean, that's what he wanted to do. He knew a reason why he left him back there. Apparently to at least give opportunity to these unbelieving people to hear the word of the Lord from a man who had a testimony that they could not argue with. This man had a testimony they could not disregard. They can't say, oh, well, that's all in your head. Sir, calm down. This God of your imagination, we don't want to hear about him. They would have to look him in the eye and, and the only thing they could say that would be anything of truth would be like, we don't want anything to do with that. They couldn't excuse that away. They, this man's deliverance and change was, would have had to have been undeniable. My goodness. So Jesus says, okay, I'm out of here. And he leaves. And so he, he crosses back across um, the lake, the, the river. I don't know. 
I don't have a Bible in front of me when I record these things. I'm driving in my truck. So he goes back to where he originally was. In the very first verse, I believe it's in the Mark account, in Mark 8, it says the people were waiting for Jesus. And they, one version says, they thronged him. They came at him, anticipating his return. Jesus is back. Praise the Lord, he's back. What a contrast. What a contrast we see. Can we see it as black and white as it is made to us? So Jesus is thronged by this mob of people awaiting his return to them. And herein, we immediately find two awesome accounts of things that are very well known right away. The lady with the issue of blood is right there at the beginning of his return back to that specific place. If I could just touch him, if I could even touch his clothes, I have the faith to believe that everything I need he possesses. Here I am in my point of depravity and need and lack and sickness. Oh, but if I can just touch him, everything will be changed. And I would assume she had no idea that that's exactly what just happened across the body of water. Maybe a day or two before. Who knows how close those were back to back? I don't know. But she believed and she expected and the people longed for him to come back to them. What a contrast. So of course she's healed. And then somebody else comes on the scene. Jairus. My daughter's died. Word comes, my daughter has died. And we all know the story. More signs, wonders, miracles, restoration of life. All rooted and established in a spiritual man perspective who says, oh, no, no, no. No, she's not dead. Bring her something to eat. So can we not see within these biblical accounts, just this one little segment of Scripture that we could spend days discussing. Are we giving ourselves to this type of meditating on the Word and like positioning ourselves for the Spirit of the living God to illuminate what He has preserved all the way to today? So the question really is, well, what side of the lake are we going to live in? What side of the water are we dwelling in today? What ways am I negating the work of God in a brother because it affects me seemingly negatively? Or, at the very least, it costs me something. Who thinks like this? I'm really asking. Who, who thinks about these things? I want to think like this. I want to examine myself and say, number one, am I even engaged enough to be affected like this? Am I engaged enough on the behalf of another to sit beside them as Jesus moves them from death to life, originally or in measure throughout life that I anticipate this is going to cost me. This is going to affect me and say, yes, amen, let it be so. I choose to look at the demoniac and say, praise the Lord for your work. Who cares if you have my pigs? 
Who cares if you take something that's valuable, valuable to me to accomplish the eternal work in a man to move him from death to life? And the, then be positioned like those people on the other side where he returned to, who, I mean, could we even say they're sitting there, like peering out, oh, I see a boat in the distance. Do you see that? Do you think that's him? Do you think that's the one? Do you think that's the man who walks as the Son of God in our midst? And do you, can we imagine that that word maybe starts to come through the seashore, the, the lakeside, however it looked at that time? And it gets to the, the news gets to the woman with the issue of blood and she's like several blocks in town or something. I don't know. Oh my gosh, he's coming back. I have to get there. I have to be where he is. I have to throng him with these people. I have to get to Jesus. In him is something that alone can set me free. Maybe she could say, I've tried everything. No man, no thing possesses the power to set a man free like this man, Jesus. And in her persistence, just like the parables of the ones who knocked relentlessly, I'm not going away. I need bread for my visiting friend, neighbor. He's hungry. I'm not going away. You will not sleep tonight. I'm knocking on your door all night long. You must answer. We have scriptural accounts of that. We have the parables that instructed us of that principle. So may we be positioned as those people on the right side, if you will, of the water. Who give ourselves to the belief and the faith that every single thing that is necessary for me is within Jesus. And I mean, I don't have time to go there, but like we have to reckon with the fact that Jesus, that same Jesus, that flesh man Jesus, I, can need, I need to be real careful here. I'm not a doctrinal position guy. I'm, I don't have that stability in me yet. People could argue with me and win on doctrine. I get that. I'm fine with that. But like, do preachers not say that same Jesus is standing here wanting to do the same for you right now? Well, I say with great humility, I'm not sure that's right. Because Jesus is not here as he was then. But may we be careful and may we look with spiritual eyes to see and understand that that was the lesser. As I've said before, Jesus is not doing a world tour of churches to reveal himself to men. Because he was limited in the body of one man. The greater has come. So the offer to us, the offer itself is the same. And Jesus is the mediator. He is the way. He alone ushers us to 
the eternal Father. He is the one. Amen. Yes. But personal, historical Jesus is not coming to my house today. He's just not. But He is coming as Holy Spirit. In greater measure, why and how in the world can He say that He goes so that we can do as He did and even greater? Because He's no longer limited to a flesh and bone, one man body. He left to indwell an innumerable amount of men. And I will probably make this point every single time I talk. Because it bears repeating and repeating and repeating until we understand that reality of the greater. The purpose of His leaving. So yes and amen, He is here. But He is here as the eternal Holy Spirit, the the Spirit of holiness that now has tabernacled with men, indwelling a man, in plurality, in a corporate reality that can be entered into now. This is who we need to touch us and for us to reach out and touch in His present state, if you will, in this age. Jesus is in heaven interceding. We are seated now in heavenly places at His right hand. His extension of dominion on the earth. Fueled and moved by the Holy Spirit. So again, in closing, may we be on the right side of the water, expectant of the now demonstration of Jesus the Christ on the earth, which is in a people that must be positioned to say, you know what, have my swine, Lord. Have my livestock, have my possessions, have my everything. Do with it what you will if it means the redemption of a man. If it means the deliverance of a brother. If it means anything that is defined as your handiwork in men. Let it be so, Lord. Let it be so. Amen.